Okay, we're in Revelation chapter 2, starting with verse 18, and we'll get to the verses in just a moment. I want to give you a little background information as I've done. We're studying, for those of you who are uh, newer or you missed the time, we're studying, and I will continue even after the pastor's coming back for, I think, two sessions, I'm not sure, the seven different churches that are mentioned in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. I would add that from my perspective, chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation are more pertinent to the church today than the rest of the book of Revelation. Because all the rest of the book happens after the church is gone, after chapter 4, and it's all about future things. But this talks about today. And, and if you'll recall, the, the book of Revelation is broken down that way in three separate sections. So each church has a major spiritual problem that is representative not only of the church that's being spoken to, but most likely will be represented in some part in every church you ever join. In other words, the church at Ephesus has major spiritual problems in the sense that they were doing everything right except their love for the Lord wasn't strong. They had left their first love. So if you're going to get a general report on church activity, they'd get an A. But in relationship to God, they got an F. Because it really doesn't matter how much you do if you don't do it with the right heart. There's a difference between grace and works. The difference between doing something to please the Lord and just doing something because that's what Christians do. And there's a difference in some reward, it seems like, as well. The church, the next church we studied was the church at Smyrna. And the church at Smyrna, if you remember, was the church that had pressure on it. You remember that word, thlipsis, it's to, to crush. And he says, I know the pressure you're living in. It, this is the only church that he doesn't find fault with. And he says, I would just keep on doing what you're doing, which has always been amazing to me. It's like you would expect him to say, I'll help you. In the morning, your pressure will be gone. But the truth is, that's not what life is about. Some of us live our entire lives under some kind of pressure or another. And I have to remind myself that what's pressure to you may not be pressure to me, and vice versa. You know, the fact is that some of the things are going on in your life, I'd say, well, get over it. But it's like puppy love. You know, it's real to the puppies, even though we stand there and look at it like, you know, one day you'll finally meet somebody. But the truth is, I, it's about, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll just try to keep on the subject. Uh, so the next talk, we just talked about Pergamos. It was a church that there's a, there's a danger in doctrinal compromise, allowing, in this case, idolatry to become a part of the worship. And so that wouldn't be good. And, and by the way, I, it would be good for you to stop and think, are there things even in central church? And I'm a member of it, uh, not on staff for those of you that are visiting. That it would be good for us to make sure that none of what we do is done in the sense of idol worship or just tradition. Is it really what God wants us to do? That's a fair question to ask ourselves as we minister to God. Because it may seem right because of the way it was or the whatever or who, where you came from. But the fact is it may not be godly just because it's, it seems right. So today we're talking about the church at Thyatira. It, the, the Greek version of it would be Thyatira, but it's the same place. It still exists today. It's a, it's a little town. It, it doesn't have the same name. It's about Clovis size. It's maybe a little smaller than Clovis. It's in the 30,000 range. Not much is left of the original town in the middle of the town from the pictures that I've seen. I've never been there. Is a, it's like a park. And everything else is built around it. All these high-rise buildings, very modern buildings. There's a park, if you can imagine, a, a little park in the middle of our town with ruins in it, none of which are really developed. And the reason is, there's an Islamic government there. All of Turkey is not all that happy about trying to develop Christianity in their world. And so, uh, the churches are all asked the same kind of problem. And God, is looking, he's like he's given them a spiritual 
he's looking at him through a little my, my, uh, magnifying glass, and he's saying, uh, in Ephesus, you lost your first love. And I, when I checked you out, this was your problem. And for Smyrna, you're persecuted. I know it. I see it. Keep going. And in Pergamos, you're faithful, but you've let these other people come in and spoil your worship. And now at Thyatira, it's about a false prophet, whomever she is, ruining the church, dominating the church. And the church was following them. So I call it the three-party church. And I mean that by the good, the bad, and the ugly. The three parties that I see there. Some people would call it the corrupt church. Some people would talk about the church that died of tolerance. Those are all the same thinking in, in what we're trying to do. So if tolerance is the issue, I think it's fair for us to take a moment to look at tolerance, the, the word. And, and the word, not, just, not, not the Greek word that it's originally written in, the, the Greek word means exactly what it used to mean in our world, but it's kind of changed. By the way, those of you that have a handout, every time you see one of these, that's in your handout, and the answer will come up in a minute. So tolerance used to be that if I had an opinion and you had an opinion, we disagreed. Uh, I could even disapprove and say, I don't believe that's right. But in my mind, I also know that you have a right to your own opinion. Like someone said to me earlier, everybody has the right to be wrong. Now, some people are so dogmatic to what they believe, they actually say that. But some others say, look, I don't, I don't know. If you believe that, that's your belief. But your belief doesn't make it right. So I have to accept the fact that you have a choice. And that's what tolerance used to mean. We can all get along. We agree to disagree. We can get along. In fact, even our government used to live like that. We would not all agree, but we would agree that there's more than one opinion, and, that, and so we would just go about doing what we're doing. Now, the other side of the coin is that nowadays, that is not what tolerance means. When you hear the word now, that's not what they're talking about. Today, there's pressure for everybody, for me, to, ex ex to accept and approve their, everyone's idea. And to validate it as right. So if they have an opinion that they like that, like jumping off a building is right, then I have to agree that it's right or else I'm intolerant. Well, that has nothing to do with tolerance. That has to do with who's in charge. There's a majority view and the minority view gets no credibility. So nowadays the result is that all behavior in our world is seen as normal behavior. Even that which is wrong, either scripturally wrong or morally wrong just by society's values. I, I, was, I, was, I was watching a news program last night. I don't know where it was. I was walking through. Crystal was watching it. I was on my way from a library to go back to where my computer was. And this, this man had fathered 28 children with 11 or 18, he couldn't remember, different women. And... The guy was talking to him said, well, if, if, I guess if that's the way you want to live your life, you can. And I'm thinking, is there something wrong with that? Somewhere, I mean, has our society gotten to the place where you could just go around doing anything you want? And the answer is yes. It has. As long as you stay clear of whatever we call the law, which is continually changing, then you're okay. And that's where we live. Now, do you understand? So where we live, in a way... We have like pressure as the people did in Smyrna. We have like opportunity as the people who lived in Ephesus. We have a lot of things we do in our church, but we, make, we need to make sure we're doing them in the love of the Lord. We have the same concept in, as the Pergamum, where idol worship could creep into the church because other people would say it's okay. And this, So this is what's happened at this church. Now, you see, if you don't agree with that the definition and the result, they call you phobic, like homophobic. 
And so it's what you're saying is if you don't agree with them, then it's your problem because they have the right to be that way. And if they have that right, then they are that way. That makes it right. And that's wrong. I'm sorry. It's just wrong. And so, or you will be called, you'll have discrimination. You, are you against those kind of people? No, I'm not against those people. I love those people. I love the people that are doing what they're doing. I, I, I think alcoholism is wrong. I was an alcoholic. I understand what it did to my family. You don't have to tell me about alcohol. I've lived that life. Got the t-shirt and it had too many holes in it for me. You know, it's, it was horrible. So if I say I don't agree with alcoholism, you can say, well, I'm an alcoholic and I want to be that way. And I say, okay, but that doesn't make you right. So all of a sudden now I'm discriminating against alcoholic people from the way the world sees it today because the world is intolerant using the name tolerant. Or they'll say you hate those people. Or they'll even say you're a fanatic. You're a religious fanatic and therefore if you say that, then everything that you believe is wrong. Well, you know when I was in school, you know what I learned? Atheism is a religion. It's a way they worship, but why is it just Christians that are wrong, that are fanatics, and no one else is? And it reveals to me where our world is going. It's intolerant, and we have the danger of allowing that to get into our life, allowing that to get into our church, because our, we're, we're dealing with that. I, I, I used to, when I teach, taught at Easter, and I, I don't think I'm going to do it anymore, but last, even last semester, I had young men and young ladies in the classroom who would say things to me like, well, what's wrong with that? Everybody does it. And I would say, well, if everybody jumped off the bridge, would it make it right? Or, you know, you're just going to be a duck and jump in there or what? Well, no, some things are wrong. And I said, well, who decides that? She said the majority. <laughs> and this is the product of our education system wherever they went. I don't know where they came from. Right? So the, the significant, when you read these churches in Revelation, I, I don't think I did said this before. It is very, it, one of the interesting things to me is to read the introduction because the introduction always seems to meet the need of the church. For instance, in Ephesus, they had the feeling like they were kind of alone because of where the town was and what was going on. And Jesus introduces himself as the one who walks among the churches. I know where you are. I know what you're doing. And in fact, he says that to several churches. I'm aware of who you are. I'm aware where you're going to get to Smyrna. And he says to them, I'm the first and the last, the one that comes to life. Well, that was the story of their town. Their town existed. It was run over and destroyed and rebuilt and brought back to life. And that was the, the logo or the logo or the mantra of the town, the town that came back to life. And Jesus says, no, listen, I'm, I'm really the one. Your town came back to life, but I'm, I'm really the one. So I'm the authority. I understand what you're doing. And, and then in Pergamum, remember he, has, he says, I'm the one with a two-edged sword. You remember they, the, the procurator in Pergamum, would, they would go down the street and hold a sword up to show that he had the right to life and death. And so Jesus always does that. So here he, at, at Thyatira, look, verse 18, and to the angel of the church at Thyatira, now you understand the angel is the pastor. So this is a personal word to the pastor of the church that seems to be given in a way that it should be disseminated to the church. Here's what he's saying. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like flame and fire, his feet are like fine brass, and he has, and his feet are like fine brass. Sorry, let me stop, stop there. So in Pergamum, in, in Thyatira, the city was founded by uh, one of the Seleucids, the very first of the Seleucids and his son. You remember the Seleucid was one of the four generals of Alexandria, of Alexander the Great when he broke, broke it up. Lysimachus, Seleucus, Ptolemy. <laughs> On my mind, there's this blank space. It's going, <laughs> I'll think of it. And so he's one of those. The patron god of that city was Apollos. Apollos was the son of Zeus. So they called him the son of God. Zeus is the major God, the father God in the Greek God system. So here comes Jesus. It's the only time he has ever said this. He walks up to them and says, I'm the son of God. Like you think you know who the son of God is. He's actually running your life 
but I am the Son of God. And he describes himself with these words. This is a picture or an artist's drawing of a statue that represented Apollos. He was a, a, anyway. So he's the son of God who has eyes like flame, a fire, and feet like burnished bronze. Now, let me stop and just say, and we're going to go over this again, so I'm going to do it fast. There were guilds in Thyatira more than there were in any other city that are in that area. A guild, a labor guild, is very much like a union today except it was a place where the workers would go and learn the craft and they would be together. However, if you weren't a member of the guild, you couldn't get a job. Does that sound familiar to you in our world? And so the problem with it is, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the problem in a minute. So the major things in Thyatira was the wool industry. And they had a root of a plant there that made the most beautiful crimson color, sometime called purple, in the world. It was the only place that you could get that. And Lydia, Acts chapter 16, you remember Lydia? Was most likely an agent for the, McComp the wool company in Thyatira who was transposed and selling it outside of, outside of the area. That's the assumption. The other that trade that they had was bronze. And because of their trade, the water had a lot of minerals in it, and they thought that's what made the dye so effective. It wasn't necessarily the root, it was the water. But they had huge copper and bronze and brass foundries there. And these labor guilds controlled whether you could work there or not. So the bronze is he saying and the bronze obviously is is a sign of judgment and strength it can withstand the fire more than obviously a piece of wood could i'm talking about jesus says this is who i am it almost brings back to their memory the things that happen in their in their world with he's going to say i've got hair like white wool and so i look back and got some other scriptures that i, I don't know that i put these on your handout but other scriptures where the same kind of language is used to show a heavenly being or Jesus Christ. They're like in Revelation, the beginning of Revelation, he says his hair is white like wire, like wool, and his eyes were like fire, and his feet burnished bronze. It's made to glow in a furnace. You see, and that these people, that's what they do. They furnace stuff. They're used to that color. They're used to the, the, the brightness of the color, which determines the temperature of the metal. His voice was like many waters. In Ezekiel, it says... Their legs were straight. These are angelic beings. Their legs are straight, like their feet like a half cook's, but their feet were like burnished bronze. We're talking about an angelic being. In Daniel 9, it says, I kept on looking till the, angel, till the thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. That's Jesus. He takes his seat, and his vesture was like white snow, and his hair was as pure wool, and his throne was ablaze with flames, and its wheels were a turning fire. These are all pictures of Jesus. And, and the last one, is in Daniel again. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Euphaz, and his body was also like beryl, that's the color of a stone, and his face had the appearance of lightning, and his eyes were like flaming torture, his eyes and feet were the gleam of bolished bronze, and his words sounded like a tumult. All of these say this. He gives them an image of one who's able to carry out the promise and who has authority to do it. He is the Son of God. And to that, you should say, hallelujah. Because that's who he is today. You see, you can't be the Son of God and lose it. And so that's where he is, and that's what he is. And these labor guilds were there. Well, the problem with the labor guild is, wherever the labor guilds are found in history, <coughs> there's always much immorality around them. And this is the reason. Every labor guild has its own patron god. And every labor guild, therefore, would have a festival to that god every year, which is where you got your certification from. Much like when, if you've been here one of the nights where I talk about emperor worship, they'd give a certificate if you actually did that that year. And so the problem is, in here, they would have it in the Temple of Apollos. 
which would include sexual immorality and things eating meat that was offered to an idol. And if you're a Christian and you're in the labor guild, you have to make a choice. Am I going to the festival so I can keep on working or am I going to make a stand and I won't be able to work? You would be like a scab in this world today. They had that much control over what was going on. And so I think we can understand exactly what that is. So they're, they're over there. They have to do this. And, and so they're understanding, these Christians are understanding that no matter how much work you do in the church, if you have lost your goal and your direction and compromise with the world, it detracts from what you're doing. And here's the verse for you. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Do you know, I read the Bible for three years, three years be, before I actually learned what that verse meant. I would say it all the time, but I always read it like this. A double-minded man is unstable in the area in which he's double-minded. Like if I'm un unstable about one thing, all the rest of my life is okay. And I got to start studying that verse. It's not what it says at all. It says you've lost your moral compass. If you're double-minded, if you have as much of the world and as much of God and you're doing like this every day, you will be unstable in all of your decisions because the base upon which you make your decision is cracked. It's not strong. And that's what these people are going through. They have to make this decision every day. Every festival time. And so Jesus commends them. And here's what he says to them. I know your deeds. And I know your love. And the word for know there is I've experienced that. I know this from experience. I've watched you enough to know it. It's not like somebody gave me a briefing paper and I know about it. He says, I know it. It's more intimate. And I know your faith. I know the level of your faith. And I know your service. And I know your perseverance. Well, listen, they're on a roll. And then Jesus looks at him and he says, oh, by the way, I know that your present deeds are greater than your, faith, than your pre previous deeds. Now, Joel reads that and he says, well, I would like to pastor that church. I mean, they're going in the right direction. You can't under, you can't, it's in the same way that Smyrna is going in the right direction. They're going in the right direction. They're, and in Ephesus, they're going in the right direction. The problem is that Jesus is going to find a problem with them in the same way he did with Ephesus. As Ephesus was doing those things, and he said, yeah, but you're not doing it out of love. He's going to find a problem with them. And this is, so this word for deeds is the word, uh, Ergon would be the Greek word. This is actually erga, but it doesn't make much difference. Ergon is not like I cut the grass today. That's my deed. It's the motivation by which I cut the grass. It's what drives you to do things, not the deed itself. He said, I know your deeds. Oh, by the way, I know your love. There are several words in Greek for love. This is the one for the kind of love that God has for people. You know it well, agape. Actually, this is the word for agapao. It's, it's a, a verb form, but it doesn't make much difference. I know your love. And it's not like, it's not like I come from Philadelphia. Phileo is the word for brotherly love. I come from the city of brotherly love. <coughs> and so Phileo would be like, the, we, are, we are friends together like this. We are socially friends, but some of us have a little bit of God's love for each other and some of us don't. We're just friends. It's not that word at all. It's the word for God love. I know your faith, your, your pisteo. I know your faith. Your faith is what you put your faith in is the most important thing about your faith. The quantity of faith isn't as important as what you put your faith in. Because if you put your faith in the wrong thing, like some of us years ago uh, that lost a good part of our 30501C3 uh, or whatever that is, whatever that is, ah, you know what I'm talking about. Then all of a sudden you woke up and <laughs> you lost $20,000 you think, I didn't even have that money. Yes, you did. <laughs> and you lost it because you had faith that it would be okay and all of a sudden the world went crazy and it wasn't okay. So you have as much faith as you want to, but if the world changes, it's not any good. So is your faith in Christ? And that's what this means. Their faith is in the right thing and they're doing it. Faith is something you do, something you have. Faith always 
has a work. And according to James, faith without works is, the word is dead, but it means useless. Like, why would you have faith if it's not working? Say, I've got a saw out in my garage that I'm not using. It is useless at this point. I could say I've got it. I could walk you around it, but I haven't been out in my garage for a month. It's sitting there. The dust that's on it is not saw dust. <laughs> so it's useless. You understand? Even though it's useful, it's useless to me. And so, and service. This is the word. Uh, you'll, I'll, t I'll give you the English word for it. Deacon. Diakonos. It's the word for ministry. It's not like how you served him. It's the word for, I know your ministry. This church was ministering well. And then he says, I know your perseverance, which is the word for to continue on regardless of the obstacle. It's a picture word. He says, I know all those things. I, I know all of them. In fact, if I were going to say it to that church, I'd say it this way. Hey, you are an upward moving church. This church is growing. It's doing all the right things. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And you know the reason I know that is because the way you used to be isn't the way you are now. You are more mature in Christ than you ever were. But I've got a problem. Now, this isn't the right shoe and the left shoe deal. You know, I'm waiting for the other one to drop. Jesus is giving them a report. I'm telling you, this is like a spiritual. Like you go to the doctor for a physical. This is Jesus giving the church a spiritual. And he says, here's his problem. And, and I'll draw a picture of it for you so you can see it. It says right here, as I read, uh, nevertheless, verse 20, I have a few things against you. It's not just one. Because you allow the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. That's his problem. So here's a picture of the church at Thyatira. That's all of the church, including the leadership. Now, remember, he's talking to the leader, and some people would read that to say, I have a problem. I know your works. Like he's talking to the pastor individually, but I think it's one of those y'alls. You know, y'all, there's y'all and all y'all, right? You understand? This is all y'all. And so he says, this is the church of Thyatira. The problem with it is those, there are people in the church that I would call the good. They're doing everything right, and there's no problem with them. Zero. There are some people in the church who are called the bad, and these are the people that are tolerating evil. Now, listen carefully. Not doing evil, tolerating evil. Because the third group in the church is the group that I call the ugly. They're the ones, a very small group, evidently, that is calling, that is leading in its small amount, leading people in the church astray, and no one is saying anything about it. Now, I would suspect that Jesus would go after the ugly. But he's just going to give a report on the ugly. He is not going to go against the ugly. Watch the, watch the verses. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. <clears throat> she's not. She's evidently gifted in leadership and gifted in deception, but she is not a leader. He said, this person teaches and leads my bondservants to go to, go to stray. Now, this is not the word for deacons. This is the word for doulos, the word for servant, slave. A bond slave. And so, and to commit acts of adultery. He said, you tolerate her. He, she's, he's not talking about the people that are doing it. He's talking about the people that ought to know better. And there ought to be people within our church, especially those of us that are long of, to, long of tooth or more mature. You, you don't have to be 60 to be a mature Christian. I've seen mature Christians at 20. It's not about age. It's about development. And so it's not about like, I can't wait till I get older and be a mature Christian. That's, that's not it at all. And so there ought to be people who are aware of that and have enough commitment to the Lord to say, that's wrong. I'm against that. They may be the best tithers in the church. They may be from the best family in the church. They may have gone to the best schools in the world. 
but they could still be wrong. And the problem that Jesus was having was that the people, evidently, they knew enough. He wouldn't hold them accountable for something that they already didn't know. So evidently, they knew it was wrong and were tolerating them instead of disciplining them. And he uses a picture of an Old Testament character, personality, called Jezebel. So I need to take about five minutes quickly. So you, for those of you who don't know the story well, to give you at least an overview on it. Jezebel, King Ahab, who was Omri's son. There were two really bad kings in all of Judah's history, and these are they. Omri, who I think of as Ornery, and his son, who was worse. <coughs> and how you get worse in Ornery, I don't know. But he did it. He chose to do it. He had a poor attitude towards God. In fact, look at that verse. I've tried to make it darker so you can see it. Though, I'm in 1 Kings chapter 16. Though he thought it was just a trivial thing to continue the sins of Jeroboam. Now, I don't know that you know about the Jeroboam guy or not. And I don't, I don't have obviously the time to hold do it. But Jeroboam was the first king of Israel. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, had a confrontation with the people, and the people of the north separated from the south. It's exactly the opposite of our civil war. They separate from there, and they get a king to take a person to take the kingship, and his name was Jeroboam. There's Rehoboam and Jeroboam. South, north. Judah, Israel. Jeroboam was actually the son of one of Solomon's servants who uh, met a prophet called Ahijah, and the prophet met him and was wearing a new garment. He takes part of the garment, he tears it, he gives it to him, and this is God's doing. He said, one day you're going to be in charge of ten tribes. And he, they dis, he disappears. I'm not disappears, but they go away. So Solomon hears about it. He wants to kill him. Jeroboam flees to Egypt. After he hears that Solomon's dead, he comes back. And as he comes back, all of a sudden, he becomes popular with the people because the people knew that he was against Solomon. Well, after this thing about Rehoboam, you know, the people said, look, if you'll just not tax us so much and don't be so critical and don't be so hard, we will serve you. So Rehoboam, instead of talking to some elders or something like that, talks to the young men and they tell him, hey, be hard. You won't be a leader unless you're hard. So Rehoboam goes out and says, you see this muscle right here? The comparison to this muscle is like the one to this and the one right here in my leg. That's how hard I'm going to be to you. This will be my father. This will be me. Well, duh. They got mad at that. They said, I'm not staying around here. And they split. The ten tribes, that's how the northern tribes became into existence as a separate unit. So Jeroboam, the very first thing he does is set up two <coughs> altars. Here's the map of Israel. I carry it here. Place I go. Up here in Dan at the very top and down here in Bethel, which is just on the border of Judah. He thought to himself, now that I'm in charge of all these people, these people may go back down to Jerusalem because they're so used to having to go to Jerusalem for the feast days. They're, I'm going to lose them. So he sets up his own altar, his own feast day system. This is all in 1 Kings 12, 13, 14, like that. And so he sets up his own feast day system and his entirely <laughs> religious system. So here's what Jeroboam's sin was. He had his own religious system instead of God's. Every king of Israel committed the same sin. There are 20 kings of Israel, the tribes of Israel. Every one, and as you read their saying, it says, and he committed the sins of Jeroboam. So, you see, his basic philosophy of his life is that he could do the same thing Jeroboam did. If I, if I don't feel like worshiping, I don't have to. 
If I want to worship the way I want to, I could do whatever I want. I can invent my own God, and I could do it. And why would God be mad about that? I'm still worshiping. You remember when Jesus talked to the people in the Lady in Samaria? And he said, you worship here on Mount Gerizim, but we worship in Jerusalem. That's the result of this decision. They come back, and now they have their own religious system, their own God system, their own feast days. They think they're doing it right, and Jesus said, no, you're not. So the result of his philosophy was he married Jezebel. She was a, the wife, the, the daughter of a king that he was, of the Phoenician king that he was trying to make a trade agreement with. They sealed it with the wife, but she is the one who brings Baal worship into Israel. She's the very first one. And he thought it was okay to do that, and the consequence was he worshiped Baal. And from that point on, Israel more worshiped Baal. And now you understand from this point, Israel is the north, Judah is the south. So when I say Israel, I'm talking about all the Jews. I'm talking about the ten tribes. They would worship Baal as a default position. That was all of the promises of the prophets. So here's my advice to you. If you lay down with the dogs, don't be surprised if you get up with the police. He married the wrong person. He knew it was the wrong person. He did it because it was better for his trade and cause an entire country to go the wrong way. In the same way that God told Solomon, don't marry people outside of your race. And he did all, not your race, but your religion, sorry. And he married people of all different races who had different religions, then built temples to them. That's the same kind of idea. Ahab is the one who developed the most of the Asherah. And an Asherah is either a built idol or a tree near an altar that has been carved as, I'm trying to be the politest I can, this is the best picture I could do in public, as a phallic symbol. So when these people that you hear about in the Bible are bowing at Asherah, they're actually bowing before a huge phallic symbol. About fertility, obviously. About a God that can meet your needs, obviously. So, but you see, God had already told him years ago in Deuteronomy, don't, when you, when you make your own, when you make your own idea of worship, don't build Asherah. Because he knows where it leads, obviously. And by the way, when you build an altar for yourself, which they could back then, because the temple didn't exist, don't build an Asherah pole next to it. It's the distraction, it's where it leads you and all those things. So this king is the one who sold himself, look, sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. He sold his soul, if you'll let me say it that way. It, God wasn't so near important anymore. Other things became more important. And all of a sudden, something else became God in his life. You know that goes on today in churches and in homes every day. Something else comes up more important than God in your life, and God starts to get pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, and all of a sudden, you don't worship God anymore. You just say, well, I was saved when I was six, and I just don't go to church much. Well, excuse me. That's wrong. It's not the behavior that God wants. It's when you allow, that's another God in your life, or a sign of spiritual immaturity, either one. But the cause was, you notice, because Jezebel incited him to do that. She said, honey, it's okay if you do that. We're married. I, I, don't, I'm, I don't believe the same thing you do. Let's bring that into our life. It'll be fine. The worst thing you could do be Ahab would be one of his killed. He killed almost every one of his own children. He was so centered on Ahab. Now, I know you can't read this, but I, you can see colors. This side is Israel, the kings and queen uh, that served in the northern tribes. This side is Judah. Now, obviously, Israel went into captivity long before Judah, right? The difference between 722 and 586. And so, but look at this color chart. The further you get this way is evil. Every king in all of Israel was evil in God's sight. Every single time you read it in the Bible, it says he was evil. And he continued the sins of Jeroboam. But there were some good queen, queen, uh, kings in Judah. Now, the other difference is this side, which is Judah, Starts with Rehoboam and goes all the way down to the last king, Zedekiah, which is when Jerusalem fell. These kings are all related in family. It's all one dynasty. Why is that important? Because the line for Christ comes through this. The line of Christ can't come through this because they're not all the same family. 
in one place, the general kills him, and he becomes king. Different family, different, different idea. So he says, but, and, and so this is what Jesus said. I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. Why? Because she is teaching. Now, listen to the responsibility to the leadership. How in the world did this woman become a teacher? Now, I don't want to get into the problem about what should women teach. That's an entirely different problem. I'm talking about how did she get enough authority in the church for her to get the ear of people in the church? What were the leadership doing? Yeah, that's the answer. Nothing. They didn't want to make waves. They didn't want to have problems instead of standing up for what's right. Not only that, she leads my bond service. This is the word for slaves. Isn't it funny that Jesus used the words for bond slaves when he talks about his people? The people do ministry to God like a deacon kind of thing. And over here, but Jesus said, no, no, they're my slaves. We are slaves to Christ. Do you understand that? He is our master. And if he's our master, he has every right to tell us what to do. Either that or he's not master. Listen, he's either Lord or not. He can't be almost Lord. He can't be sort of master. He's either Lord of your life or he's not. And so he does that. And what happened? These people started to commit acts of adultery, acts of immorality. Some of them were spiritual and some of them, I believe, were physical. And what's worse, they eat things sacrificed to idols. You know, that's, that's sort of like talks to one of the commandments, doesn't it? To have other gods before him? He's your only God? And, and God is saying there are other people who will purport themselves to be a God, but you should not keep your eyes on them because your eyes are on me. I had one time a man came to my office and he said, I have this problem. I, every time I'm in a restaurant or something like that, if a woman goes by, I just can't help but looking at her. He said, how do I do that? And I said, keep your eyes on your wife. If you keep your eyes right in her eyes, it'd be hard to look at somebody else. It's not the woman's fault. I mean, if you really had morals, she could run around naked when you wouldn't have a problem. But the fact is, you need to keep your eyes where they're supposed to be. Done deal. End of story. Or get a lawyer. There's your two choices. I mean, so you see, but so this, is more about, this is more about spiritual adultery than it is physical adultery. You know, do you understand? Did you see the context of, of, of what we're talking about? It's all about the, the things they're doing spiritually. Was physical adultery wrong? Yes. But I am convinced that physical adultery doesn't happen until spiritually, spiritual adultery does. That's always the beginning. So they were committing adultery with her, had entered into the depths of Satan. Everything she's probably saying to them, listen, I've got a deeper way for you to experience God. You just let a little bit of this into your life and you could really experience God. Think of the emotions that are involved with sexual acts and sexual things. Hey, it's still that way in our world today. I dare you to look at television for 20 minutes without seeing something sexual on it, including the advertisements. They're, that's the way our world is. Our kids are being desensitized to what's wrong because there's so much of that on there, they think it's what's right. The heroes all do it. This is the world we're living in, friends. And so, so is it physical practice? I don't know. Here's, this is the word for adultery, this word right here. What word do you see? pornography. And that word is used for physical immorality, like fornication. And it's also used for spiritual when you have a relationship with another God in, its, in scripture. Don't become, don't have practice whoredom to gods would be the King James way to say it. And so, but I'll tell you, it's got to be in my mind. I don't know whether that is talking about physical or not, but I'll tell you this, it surely infers Spiritual adultery, because that's the subject. That's what's going on at the time. I'm sorry, forgive me. I'm trying to lose weight, but you still can't see around me. Huh? Just, I know, I am. Th Thanks. I had to tell you. You wouldn't even tell me that before. Oh. <laughs> so, so here's the followers of Jezebel. Here's, now, here's, the, here's what's happening in Thyatira. They teach people to eat, advocating that they have kids attend to more uh, meals. And because it's part of the guild... You go, you go do that, and it's okay, because that's what you have to do to get ahead in Thyatira. Have you ever heard the sentence, go along, go along to get along? That's it, spiritually. I can't quite do that. I, want to, I don't want to give much of a witness, because the truth is, my boss might fi fire me. So I'm not going to give a witness. I'm not going to even mention it. And believe me, there's more people that work with that problem than almost any other problem in the church that I've ever found. 
you're fortunate if you work in a place where you can freely reveal your Christianity. But does that mean you have to go along with everything they do? No. Uh, and you'll say, well, you don't even know what you're talking about. When I was in the Air Force, I was, I was uh, in charge of a shop. In fact, I wound up in charge of the flight line. So the commander comes up to me and says, we're going to have commander's call, and you're in charge of it, Sergeant Horn. I said, thank you, sir. Where, uh, how much soda can I buy? He said, soda? I said, commander's call. He said, that we drink beer at commander's call. And I said, well, sir, not everybody drinks beer, and I want you to understand there are people in your place, in your squadron, that when you make do that, they think less of you. He said, do you know who you're talking to? I said, yes, sir, I know you understand, Colonel. I got it. But that doesn't make them go away. If you really cared about them, you'd buy some soda. <laughs> I stayed 20 years. <laughs> I mean, you understand? You, you just can't shut up for the rest of your life. Someplace, you've got to stand up. It's time to get hair on your leg one day. And so you understand? And so I don't, I, I don't think it cost me something. Maybe I didn't become president because of it or something. I don't know. <laughs> so if the standards, you see, if the standards of God's words clash with per business or personal in interests, the standards ought to be abandoned. Why? Because getting ahead is more important than who you are. Now think, that sounds horrible, but people live it. And that's what Jesus was against. That thought, just that process. And so it's, those things. So what kind of tares, remember the story of the wheat and the tares? What kind of tares are sown in church today? I'll give you a few, not many. Number one, legalism. People who are legalistic about their belief all deny in some way or another the, the completed work of Christ, that what Christ did was enough. The best illustration of that is the book of Galatians in the New Testament, where they had to add something to salvation like being Jewish, like following the feasts, those kind of things. What Christ did wasn't enough. You can't get saved with that. You have to add something. I've seen that in church just as simple. I've, actually, I was walking through the hall one day when I was in Post, Texas, and this man actually said to this young boy, if you don't go to Sunday school, you're probably lost. And so he was one of the deacons of the church. And I, I didn't say anything right then, but I really remembered who the kid was. And after, it, after a church, I said, would you, would you please find that someplace in this book for me? In fact, I dare you to find Sunday school in this book. At best, it would have been Saturday school. <laughs> now, how did you say that? And he said, well, I'm just trying to encourage him. I said, sir, you are not encouraging him. You are hurting him. You are cursing him. Because suppose his parents won't let him come to Sunday school. Suppose he can't get to Sunday school. Did you offer to go get him? No, you just condemned him for not being here. Well, he, I, he said, what do you think I should do? I said, I think you ought to go over his house and tell him. You want me to go with you? I'll be glad to. Don't wait, let it wait till next week because Satan will have him by next week. You know, you've got to have a God. If you don't jump through the hoops, God doesn't love you. Forgive me. That is out of the pit of hell. He decided to love you before you ever thought about him. That's the way my Bible talks. You were chosen from the foundation of the earth. And so he, you don't have to do anything for God to love you. And those of us that had parents that didn't, but you were loved on condition, we don't even understand that. We have to learn it. But it's a good thing to learn. Gnosticism is a denial of Christ's humanity. They would say Jesus couldn't be man. Why? Because the, the Gnostics believed that flesh and spirit were separate and the flesh couldn't be good. Only the spirit. And whatever happened to the flesh didn't affect the spirit. So you can go party all you want. You can be an Epicurean if you wanted to and have fun all the rest of your days. And God wouldn't care. It'd be okay. Because it doesn't affect you spiritually. And that's what it does. Emperor worship denies Christ's lordship. The people in Smyrna, the people in Ephesus. Now, there doesn't seem to be emperor worship going on here in Thyatira. The people in Pergamum all had to go and sacrifice at the altar of Caesar once a year in order to get a certificate so they could be seen as a citizen. And they had that pressure. It had to deny the lordship of Christ. By the way, that's the entire beginning of the entire Maccabean revolt. That's what it's all about. Bow to Caesar. This old man says, I'm not going to bow to Caesar. He's not my God. And somebody else said, I'll do it for him. And he goes out. The, the old man grabs the, the sword from the soldier and kills the other Jewish guy who's going to bow down. He said, we will not bow down. And that's where that war started. That entire revolt. 
because somebody wanted to do that. And denial of accountability. The Nicolaitans, you, we talked about those last week, so I'm not going to go back over it. They had that same concept of, I don't have to listen to anybody. You could do, and you're free to choose. So here's his correction. He says to them, you're going the wrong way. You need to turn around. That's the word for repent. You need to turn around. Repent is not to alter your course. Repent is to turn around. It's not making a mid-course correction. It's mean you're going totally in the wrong direction. So repent, repentance always has an action. Yes? You would, also, you would know when you turned around. <laughs> and here's what he said about this woman. It's not, I don't think there's a woman named Jezebel. I think he uses that in a way like hyperbole to say this is that person. It's, it's a, just an illustration. He says, I gave this woman in the church time to repent, and she doesn't want to repent. In fact, the words, I was just reading it while Crystal was getting her nails done. I took some, a book with me, and I was, I was just looking over it to make sure I knew what I was doing. This is the word that means she made a purposeful choice to say, no, I will never repent. It's one of those things. Like I stamp my foot, and I'm like, no, not me, period. I'm not doing it. And so... I just want you to see that, and here's some verses you can look up later. The most <laughs> sinful person in this room can repent if you will. The problem is you won't. It's not that God doesn't want to hear you repent your prayer. God doesn't want to hear your confession. It's that you don't want to give it in any circumstance. There's nothing that God could do to make you repent because you are choosing not to repent. That's what the word means. And he said, I gave her that choice. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw her in a bed of sickness. Now, this is the hardest verse in the whole thing to do. And this is what it says. That's, that's the, the word bed is not the same word for bed. It's the word for a sick place. And it doesn't mean sickness. It instead means, I think, it's a picture of what's going to come in the last time. These people, notice the connection between sickness and to the great tribulation. He's saying those people are going to go through the tribulation. That he's talking about, it's called eschatology, last times. That's a picture of that. So these people couldn't be saved, Jezebel and her crowd. But Jesus is more mad at the ones that are saved that aren't doing anything about it. In other words, I know where she's going. I'll take care of her. They're being violent in the church. I'm going to be violent with them. I'm going to pay her back for her deeds in the same way that you're going to get paid back for your deeds in heaven. Those kind of talk make me think, and, and by the way, by the second century, there was no church in Thyatira any longer. See this word up here? This is not a person. This is a group. These are people who were against the teaching of John, the apostle. See, see this word? Lagos is the word for word. Anytime there's an A in front of it, it means the opposite. They're against the word. They're the people who were against the word. And they were, they were against John the Baptists, and they were happy to report that the church in Thyatira had disappeared by the second century. Well, that's not very long after what Jesus was talking about here in history. The church was gone. He said, I'll kill her children. Now, he's not talking about babies. He's talking about those that are following Jezebel, their children. In the Jewish mentality, the children are responsible for the sins of their parents. And he's saying, that's your leader. You're going to follow her. You're going to get the same, you're going to get the same exact uh, punishment judgment why because i'm the one that can search hearts and minds i'm the one that really knows what's going on jesus doesn't know about you he knows you he doesn't know what he doesn't know about what you do he knows everything you do and i'll give you a verse for it hebrews 4 13 and there's no creature hidden from his sight but all things are laid open all things are laid open him to the eyes of him that could see of whom we have with to do. He's talking about Jesus. You are not going to escape being here. Listen, if he's God, does he know everything? So you reckon you're going to hide in a closet and he won't know it. Or those of you in the military, you're going to go TDY, do what you want to do, and God doesn't know it because you're TDY. Now your wife doesn't know it. I think she does, by the way. But God knows. He knows where you are. He knows what you're doing. He knows we're on vacation. He knows all those things. So here's the continuation and I'll be done. So I say to you and the rest in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching and who have not known the deep things of Satan. In other words, you've not been duped. I have no more burden to put on you. Keep on doing what you're doing. I'm not against you. I'm against those among you who are tolerant. See that? 
that as they call them. In other words, they're, they're not really the deep things of Satan. They're just another satanic trap. This is not an intellectual thing about how to get closer to God, which I think is probably the way they sold it, but rather something in that nature. So the compromise is clear. Here it is. Tolerate evil or keep following the truth. That's your job. That's my job. Either if, tolerate, if, if it's in the church or in my life, I've got one of two choices. Live with it or stand against it. You say, well, you may pay the price. And I'm saying, well, listen, you make, you make your choice. You want the ultimate price or the immediate price? You want the ultimate reward or the immediate reward? Sure, you get an immediate reward. Satan can do that in your life. But can you get the ultimate reward? No. Because only one person gives that out. That ultimate promise. So he says, hold fast. By the way, did you notice that most of the time we're threatened by the world? It's to lose the worldly things. You won't get the, you lose your job, you lose your family, you lose blah, blah, blah. You ever notice that? That's the only thing he can really threaten us with. Remember what Paul said about that? I count everything lost except for the knowledge of Christ. It's like dung. In other words, he takes the worldview and turns it. You see, decision making is a matter of your value system. Your paradigm in life. What you think is valuable. I've got some things in my house that I think are valuable that I think some of you would think are junk. But I see them as highly valuable in my, value, in my value system. And it's true about all of us. So let me give you an opportunity. Tomorrow night here at the church at 7 o'clock. I don't know the man. I don't know exactly what he's going to say. I know the organization. They're going to have a meeting. And the whole concept is talk about why it's necessary for us to stand up in our Christian values in the public square. That's where we live. And these people are supposedly coming to help us make those decisions and give us information on how to do that. I challenge you to be here. Not because we get paid by the head and not because anybody will even know that I'm doing it except this group right here. But it is an opportunity for you to say, how can I live my life? And the answer is yes, this way. That's why our church does things like that. And I understand there's going to be some information given out. I want to make a difference in my kingdom. How about you? This morning at breakfast, I was there with one of the men of the church, and I was, I'm was mentoring him, discipling him. And The waitress came up, and I said, you know, I, I need to apologize to you. And she said, for what? And I said, well, you were here, and we were praying for our food. And I never turned around and asked you, is there anything that I can pray for you about? So can I do that now? Is there something in your life that I need to pray for while I'm praying? She said, knock on wood, everything is gone. I'm thinking, that wood ain't going to help you. <laughs> but I said, okay. And I said, do me a favor. I come in here every Wednesday morning for breakfast. <coughs> if there's ever something you need, would you come and tell me? Because I'd love to pray for you. She said, thank you, sir. And the biggest smile got on her face. Not like you bothered me. Did I win her to the Lord? No. Did I witness? Did she know that there was somebody in the world that cared about her? She's an 18-year-old girl who's trying to find her way in life. Why would I want her to walk into a ditch if I could? See, that's where you learn that. So look, he who overcomes and keeps my deeds until the end, and I think that's the first reference in, the, in Revelation to the millennial kingdom, I'll give him authority, and it's the fact that believers are going to share in the kingdom over the nations. And the overcomers are first found in 1 John. You, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are an overcomer. Not what you're going to do. You are an overcomer. And it says here's a picture of the believer who keeps on overcoming. That's in life. We're not talking about you're going to finally get the victory in heaven. We're talking about here on earth. You overcome here on earth. Not eventually, but immediately. So is, are my problems still happening? Yes. Am I living a life that's conflicted? Yes. Is most of my life more like a conundrum than it is a symphony? Yes. Can I keep on going? Yes. Why? Because he's given me the power. He has given me the ability. He's given me the perseverance. I just need to do it. And so that's what I want to be. And so they shall rule, and you will be part of that. Believers, you and I are living in a world that's going to be judged by God. One day, God's going to walk up to Russia and say, I'll take over now. You can step, forget communism. One day, God's going to go over to Rome and say, you know, Catholicism, I'll take over that right now. I've got a better plan than that. He's going to go to the Pope and say, give me the keys to the kingdom, please. I am in charge. One day, he's coming back. 
One day he's going to go to Iran and say, you know, uh, I don't like that Islam stuff and Sharia law is junk. I'll take over now. Just close your mosques. One day he's coming back to Israel and saying, that's about being Jewish, my friend. It's about being one of God's children. And that doesn't go by your birth. That goes by your decision. Put your little synagogues away. I'll take care of that now. One day he's going to go to England and say, you know, I'll take care of the Anglican church. Don't worry about it. I'm in charge. There's not going to be religion. There's just going to be relationship. And one day he's going to go to China and say, all of your worship about animism and Buddhism and all those things, we just put all those little idols aside. I am now in charge, and every one of them will lay it down. And one day he's going to go to Australia and say the same thing. And one day he's going to come to the United States and walk right up to the president and say, I am in charge now. Does that make you want to say, come Lord Jesus? Doesn't it really? What a wonderful place to be. We'll be part of the messianic kingdom. So the, here's the promise. The promise is Jesus himself. That's the bright and morning star. And the scriptures I just went past are the scriptures that say he is the bright and morning star. So here's what he says to you, church. You that have ears, listen. Now, don't listen to the words. Listen to his heart. Listen to the meaning. You that have ears, listen. Application. Big problems can occur in small places. Don't say just because we live in Clovis. All can't happen here. Number two. Bad things can come from gifted people. Some of the most gifted teachers you will hear could still teach you something wrong. Can't go by the teacher. You have to go by the truth. In the end, and this is the end of this, this evening. Tolerance of bad teaching has no place in the church in the Sunday school classroom, in the preschool department. It has no place in the church, and you need to get your little antennas up. You'll say, I don't know much. Well, you know what you know. <laughs> and if you hear something that's wrong, you need to go to somebody and say, hey, I heard that. Is that right or wrong? Is this right or wrong? Because we shouldn't stand for it from anybody. Questions? Comments? Okay. Father, my prayer tonight is that we would do what you've said. My prayer tonight is that we would be the people that you want us to be. And my prayer tonight is that as we love you, the aroma of our love would go up into your nostrils and you would see this church high and lifted up and separate from the world, yet in it, in ministry. And I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for coming.